Hello and welcome to lecture number 13 on our series on classical mechanics. So we're continuing where we left off in the previous class. So we considered a problem where we had the expression for velocity for an elliptical path. Let me write it down. For an elliptical path, the expression for velocity was given by square root of k over m multiplied to 2 over r minus 1 over a. Now, in this particular expression, if we suppose that r is equal to the length of the major axis, 2a, then if we substitute this value into this equation, then we see that the velocity is equal to 0. But turns out that in principle, velocity is never equal to 0. There's a reason for that. So we know that under the effect of a central force field, the particle goes in an elliptical path. So we have two focus. So uh, F1 and F2, we have the force centered at focus F1. And we have this particle moving along this elliptical path, which is, let's say, the point P at this particular point. It's at a radial distance of R from F1 and making an angle theta. Now, uh, here we have R minimum. And then we have R maximum now from this figure it's evident that r max plus r min so that is equals to the length of the major axis which is 2 a now turns out if we consider the equation of the orbit in terms of theta so we have r of theta given by l divided by 1 plus epsilon times cosine of theta now we know that the value of theta is going to be 0 degree. This theta is 0 degree. Then what we get is the value of R minimum. So that means at theta equals to 0 degree, we obtain an expression for R minimum. So that will be equals to L divided by 1 plus epsilon times cosine of 0. So that's simply 1. So this is one expression for R minimum. And at Theta is equals to 180 degrees or pi radians. What we get is an expression for the maximum r. So that will be simply equals to L divided by 1 plus epsilon times cosine of 180 degree. And we know that cosine of 180 degrees said that is negative 1. So we have L divided by 1 minus epsilon. Fine. Now we have the expression for a, which is defined as L divided by 1 minus epsilon squared. Or simply in terms of L, that will be A times 1 minus epsilon squared. So if we substitute this value in R min and R max, what we get? That R minimum. So that will be, so in place of L, we have A times 1 minus epsilon squared. So we get 1 minus epsilon. And for R max, we get 1 plus epsilon. and and both of them have the factor A multiplied to it. Now clearly, from here we can say uh, for an elliptical path, we know that the eccentricity for an elliptical path lies between 0 and 1. It's not exactly equals to 0 or exactly equals to 1 because for epsilon equals to 0, that's for a circle and epsilon equals to 1, we have a parabolic path. So for an elliptical path, it lies between 0 and 1 and this these two expressions for r max and r min tells us that the value can never be equals to 2a. So we can say that velocity can never exactly goes to 0. But what is the significance of this particular expression? That means when we say that r is equals to 2a. Well, let's try to understand this. So we have an elliptical path with the force centered at one of the foci. So that is f1. And we have the other foci at F2. Now what we'll do, consider by taking F1 as the center, we draw a circle of radius 2a. So here the radius of this particular circle is 2a. Although it looks slightly bigger on the, this particular side, but this is a circle. It's a very approximate circle, not drawn to scale. Now what we do, Let's say we consider a particle at this particular point P, uh, P prime. And let's suppose that 
the particle is stationary at this point. Stationary meaning the velocity is equals to zero and this is at a distance of 2a. Let's say from this force center, this is 2a. So that's what we say that at r equals to 2a, velocity is equals to zero. So this is what we are considering. So we have a circular path. So at point p prime, which is 2a distance away from the force center, the velocity is equals to zero. Now since this is stationary, so what will happen under the effect of force field, this is going to fall towards the center. Now what happens as it falls towards the center, it's going to come along this particular straight path and let's say when it reaches this particular point P and at that point what happens? The expression for velocity is going to be equals to, it's no longer going to be zero, it's going to be equals to K over M times 2 over R minus 1 over A. And once it reaches this velocity expression, then what happens? It will start moving along this elliptical path. So this is the significance when we we say that velocity is equals to zero at r equals to two a. So this particular idea will be useful in understanding certain phenomena, which will come much later. Now coming back to our original discussion, what happens as the object travels along the elliptical path? Due to the action of the force center, there will be times when its distance is going to be closest to the force center and there will be other times when it is going to be further away. So let's try to illustrate this idea. Now we have considered F1 to be the force center and because of this particular force, central force, the object is moving along this elliptical path. Now let's consider this particular point A and particular point B on the ellipse. Now it's clear from this illustration that we F1A is the minimum distance and F1B is going to be the maximum distance. It's like further away from the force center. So these points are known as apsis. Or usually the points are referred to as the apsidal points. So if we consider the special case of an elliptical orbit, so R max and R min are going to be the Apsis. Now, these apsidal points, they have certain properties. So, let's talk about this properties. So, there will be three important properties related to apsidal points. So, we'll talk about each of them in details here. So, whenever a particle is moving along this elliptical path, so we know that when this particle is at point A, then it's going to be the nearest to the central force, and when it is at point B, it is going to be furthest away from the force center. So we can write that the absolute points are points of either maximum or minimum approach. Right. Now coming to point number two, now what happens? Central orbits are generally defined as function of theta, because we know that this is given by R, which is a function of theta. Now, as an object goes through this elliptical path, what happens at the absidal points, at this particular point A and B, the dr over the change in r with respect to change in theta, so that is always going to be equals to zero because these are maximum points. So we'll write it down here. When r goes through the absidal points, dr over d theta is equals to zero and this essentially means that dr the time derivative of the radial vector so that's also equals to zero now this is because when the particle moves along this particular elliptical path we can see that at each point the velocity changes and because the velocity changes it means that the radial vector r is also changing and what and this means that not only the theta derivative of r vanishes at extreme points a and b is also the time derivative disappear at the absidal points or the extreme points in this space-time trajectory so this is property number two now coming to property number three now recall that when we were writing the equation of motions it was given by r of theta equals to l divided by one plus epsilon times cosine of theta minus theta naught. 
Now what we did for simplicity, we actually choose theta 0, theta not equals to 0 degree. The reason being, we know that the maximum or minimum distance of approach that occurs, if this is our force center, then the minimum distance of approach occurs when theta is equals to 0 degree and the maximum approach occurs when the angle theta is 180 degrees. So this is true for some symmetric position of our angle theta naught. Now what is this? Now this particular symmetry can be easily achieved only when our abscess or the apsidal point lies on this particular reference line with theta not equals to zero. So this gives our third property. So the third property states that theta naught is equals to zero or any other angle. Uh, it could be 2 pi, it could be 4 pi pi, or any other angle of symmetry. So these are the three properties that we can derive from the abscess or the apsidal points. So what we'll do next is we'll discuss more about the velocity of the object at the maximum points, that is at the abscess or the apsidal points. So for this, let us consider the differential equation. So we consider the differential equation du over d theta squared plus u squared equals to m squared over l squared times e minus b. So there's a 2m squared here. And e minus b, so that's simply the kinetic energy. So that means when we solve for velocity. So our expression turned out to be v squared is equals to l squared over m squared times du over d theta whole squared plus u squared. Now what happens at the extreme points, at the extremum, are du over d theta. So as we have already mentioned in property number two, so that's equals to zero. So that means our expression now becomes for velocity, v squared is equals to l squared over m squared times we have zero, then we have u squared. Now we know that u is equals to 1 over r, so this will be simply equals to l squared divided by m squared times r squared. But here r we will consider as r suffix a, where r a represents the epsidal distance. So this could be either a maximum or a minimum. So that means what we can do here, we can cross multiply each side, and that means we have v squared r a squared so that's equals to l squared over m squared or simply if we take the positive square root so we have v r a so that's equals to l over m we know that for a central orbit or a central force the l is always a constant mass is also going to be constant so this is a constant quantity now if it is a constant quantity then we can immediately say that our r a the epsilon distance that could be either a minima or it could be a maxima right so whenever we have ra is minima since the product is a constant whenever ra is a minimum the velocity is going to be maximum and vice versa meaning so when we have r minimum then we have v maximum so that's a constant so let's call this constant c and this is equals to when we have v minimum that means we are talking about the maximum distance which is r max this is going to give us the ratio r max over r min so that will be equals to v max over v minimum fine and we have already obtained an expression for r max and r min so we mentioned that r max is equals to l divided by 1 minus epsilon and r minimum so that's equals to l divided by one plus epsilon so this ratio r max over r min will become one plus epsilon divided by one minus epsilon so this is equals to v max over v min now what we'll do we'll try to find out the value of epsilon so that's very simple what we can do is we can use the method of component and dividend and all. so we have one plus epsilon so let's subtract the denominator divided by 1 plus epsilon plus 
1 minus epsilon. So that's equals to V max minus V min divided by V max plus V minimum. So the expression on the right and uh, the left hand side that becomes epsilon. So this is equals to velocity max minus velocity minimum divided by velocity max plus velocity minimum. So now what we have here is an expression for the eccentricity of the elliptical path. And this is a very easy expression. Easy in the sense that if we have the knowledge about the maximum and the minimum velocity at the epsilon point, then we can very easily determine the value of this eccentricity epsilon. If we look at a very special case, special case in the sense that when we have v max equals to v minimum, so that means we have a uniform velocity here, the case of uniform velocity. And if we substitute this into our equation, then this gives us epsilon is equals to zero. And this is only true if we have a circular orbit because under a central force, only uniform velocity is possible in a circular orbit. So that means this is a case of a circular orbit. In an elliptical path, there are special names given to the epsilon points. So here is the force center. So this particular distance where it is like this particular point, which is the shortest distance from the force center, this is referred to as the perigee. And the point which is furthest away from the force center, so that will be referred to as the apogee. In previous lecture, we also worked on problem where we found out the expression of velocity for a parabolic path. So we had a parabolic path and for that our expression for velocity was given by 2k over L times cosine of theta over 2. Now in this particular case Let's try to understand it with the help of an illustration. So here we have the focus at F and we have a parabolic trajectory. So this particular point, let's call it A. So this is going to be the perigee point. But here we do not have an apogee point here. That means, it simply means that the apogee is at infinity. Now what does that mean? So that means we know that to obtain the apogee, the value of theta must be equals to pi. So when you substitute the value of pi, theta with pi in this expression, so we have 2k over L times cosine of pi over 2. And we know that cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So that means the velocity is 0. Now what does it mean? This means that our particle has gone to infinity with 0 energy because at infinity, the attractive force diminishes. So this means that the possible escape velocity with the lowest energy is going to be a parabolic path. When we found out an expression for the velocity of a particle at the epicidal point, we used the fact that du over d theta that's equals to zero at the extremum point, and that gave us v of a times r of a equals to a constant which is l over m. So there is another way to derive this particular expression. So what we do, we know that at the epicidal point, the time derivative of the radial vector r that's equals to zero. So that means the velocity vector, which is given by r dot r cap plus r theta dot theta cap. So that will be simply equals to r theta dot theta gap, meaning it is only going to have the angular component. So v of a will be r theta dot. Or this can be also referred to as, uh, this angular velocity is also referred to as the velocity at the epicidal point, r theta dot. Now we know that the angular momentum L is given by m r squared theta dot. So that means we have r times theta dot. So theta dot will be replaced with L over 
m r squared and here r is the distance from the force center to the epicentral point so this gives us l over m times r a and this is the expression for velocity of the object when it is at the epicentral point or we can simply get v a times r a equals to l over m so this is also another way how we can obtain the expression for the velocity of a particle at the epicentral point we will be using this particular expression to solve certain numerical so let's try a few problems so problem number one we have an attractive central force and this is describing a particle that moves in a particular orbit which is given by this equation so what we need to do is determine the law of force and the velocity at any point so let us begin so here we have r raised to the power of n equals to e raised to the power of n times cosine of n theta so let's label this as equation number one we know that r is one over u so we have to convert this equation to u so that will be simply 1 over u raised to the power of n equals to e raised to the power of n times cosine of n theta and we can re uh, rewrite this expression in terms of u n so that will be simply 1 over e raised to the power of n and we know well, the reciprocal of the cosine function is the secant function so this will be multiplied to secant of n theta let's call this equation number two now, this expression, we'll, we'll use this later on. We'll come back to this equation. So, this can be written as e raised to the power of n times u raised to the power of n times cosine of n theta. And this is equals to 1. So, our task will be to obtain the second derivative of u with respect to theta from this particular equation because we have to obtain the law of force. So, we need this in order to find the value of f of u. So, to do that, what we'll do, we'll need to simplify this particular expression here. So, let's take the logarithm on both sides. So, we have e raised to the power of n times u raised to the power of n times cosine of n theta. So, that's equals to natural log of 1. Now, what we'll do, we'll use the property that log of a times b. So, that's simply equals to log of a plus log of b and then we'll use the property log of a raised to the power of b so that's equals to b times log of a right so let's use that so we have n times natural log of a plus n times natural log of u plus log of cosine of n theta equals to natural log of one so that's always going to be zero right now what we do now we're going to differentiate both sides with respect to theta. So that's all we have to do. Differentiate both sides with theta. And this is going to give us, so we have n times differentiation of log a. So that's a constant. So this will be simply 0 plus n times differentiation of natural log of u. So that will be 1 over u times du over d theta plus differentiation of log of cosine theta so that's 1 over cosine of n theta and we have to apply the chain rule to differentiate cosine of n theta so that will be negative n sine n theta so this is equals to 0 so we have n over u times du over d theta so we have negative n so let's take it to the right hand side and the ratio sine of a cos so that's simply tangent of n theta fine cancel out n from both sides so this gives us du over d theta which is equals to u times tangent of n theta so we are going to label this as equation number three fine now we will again differentiate both sides of equation number three with respect to theta so we have second derivative of u with respect to theta so that's equals to so we have to apply the product rule so we have du over d theta times tangent of n theta plus u times 
so derivative of tangent of n theta so that will be secant squared n theta we have to use the cheat rule to take the derivative of n theta so that will mean this will get multiplied to n fine now what we'll do in place of du over d theta we'll substitute with u times tangent of n theta so this becomes u times so we have a tangent of n theta multiplied to tangent of n theta so this is simply tangent squared n theta plus u times n times secant squared n theta so this is the expression for d squared u over d theta squared so let's call it equation number four now what we can do now we will consider the differential equation for the force law d squared u over d theta squared plus u is equals to negative m over l squared u squared times f over u so we can use this particular differential equation to obtain an expression for the force because now we have d squared u over d theta squared and we also have u so let me note that down so we'll substitute the value obtained in equation number four into our force equation so we have on the left hand side u times tangent squared times n theta plus un times secant squared n theta so that's what we have replaced in place of the second derivative of u with respect to theta then we have plus u so let me write it as the first term so that we can combine these these two terms we'll come back to that in a moment e equals to negative m over l squared u squared times f of u so what we'll do we'll take u as the common factor from the first two terms and that leaves us with one plus tangent squared of n theta so that's the identity simply secant squared of n theta plus un times secant squared of n theta equals to now what we'll do we'll take u secant squared n theta as the common factor from these two terms so we will be getting u times secant squared of n theta so that's multiplied to 1 plus n which is equals to negative m over l squared u squared times f of u since we need the force so we will write this in terms of f of u so this will be negative l squared divided by m so we have u squared so this will be simply u cubed times n plus 1 times secant squared n theta right. now we'll have to further simplify this now let's uh, use equation number two so in equation number two let me note it down here we got the expression that u raised to the power of n is equals to one divided by a raised to the power of n times secant of n theta so if we take out secant of n theta so that's simply equals to u raised to the power of n times a raised to the power of n since we need secant squared here so we'll square both sides so we have secant squared of n theta so that will be u raised to the power of 2n plus a raised to the power of 2n now we'll substitute secant squared n theta with this particular expression so our force equation now becomes f of u so that's equals to negative l squared divided by m we'll write this u cubed later so that's multiplied to n plus 1 times u cubed so instead of secant squared n theta we have u raised to the power of 2n plus a raised to the power of 2n so we can combine the power of this two exponents here so that will give us f of u equals to negative l squared times a raised to the power of 2n times n plus 1 divided by m these are all constants so that's why i'm writing it as a common factor multiplied to we have u raised to the power of 2n plus 3 fine and we'll substitute from u back to 1 over r so this will give us the force as a function of r that's equals to let's call this some constant k so we have negative k divided by r raised to the power of 2n plus 3 the negative sign indicates that we have an attractive force so this is the expression for the force where 
let's write it down where the value of k is the constant l square times e raised to the power of 2n times n plus 1 whole divided by the mass m right so we have an expression for the force now the next the second part is to find the velocity at any point but it will have to consider the differential equation which will help us to find the velocity so let's do that so the expression for velocity is given by v squared equals to l squared divided by m squared times du over d theta squared plus u squared however in this particular case the uh, derivative of u with respect to theta this will not be equals to zero because if we look at the force so this is not the inverse square force so that was a very particular case where we consider du over d theta to be equals to zero at the epsilon points so we already obtained an expression for du over d theta so let me note it down so du over d theta we obtained it as u times tangent of n theta so we'll substitute this value here so that gives us l squared divided by m squared so we have u squared times tangent squared of n theta plus u squared now we'll take u squared as the common factor so we have u squared times l squared divided by m squared so we have tangent squared n theta plus 1, which is an identity equals to secant squared n theta. Like in the previous case, so in place of uh, secant squared n theta, we can replace it with u raised to the power of 2n times a raised to the power of 2n. So this is v squared. So we have v squared that will be equals to l squared times a raised to the power of 2n divided by m squared times u raised to the power of 2n plus 2 and what we can do we can take the square roots on both sides and take the consider only the positive value of velocity so this will be l times e raised to the power of n divided by m this is a constant multiplied to u raised to the power of n plus 1 and if we convert u to r then we have velocity v constant m divided by r whole raised to the power of n plus 1 where m is equals to the constant l the angular momentum times a raised to the power of n divided by m this is the expression for velocity as a function of the radial distance r problem number two here we are given a particle is moving in a circular path such that its center of force lies on the circumference of the orbit. Calculate the law of force. So we have a particle which is moving, let's say, along this circular path in an anti-clockwise fashion. Now we have the radius of the circle. Let's say this is the center, centered at A. Then the radius of the circle is, let's say, A. Now, supposing that our center of force is centered at a then in that case r which is the radial vector that would have been the magnitude would have been equals to a but in our case in this particular problem it's given that it's lying on the circumference so let's assume that this is the point o which is the center of force and this is going to lie on the circumference of this orbital path now in that particular case the equation of the orbit will be r equals to 2 times a and multiply to cosine of theta so that means for any point b so the radial length is going to be r with an angle of theta with the axis so this is the axis of symmetry when theta equals to zero we have r equals to twice of a so that is when this point P coincides with A, then we have OP, which is R, that will be exactly equals to O, let's call it B, since we have already chosen A here. So this is B, that in that case, that will be equals to 2A. And when we have theta equals to 90 degree, that means that our point P is moving closer and closer to point A. And in that case, R will be simply equals to 0. 
now let's begin from here now that we have the equation of the orbit so r will replace it with 1 over u such that our equation now becomes 1 over u equals to 2a times cosine theta and if we take the reciprocal on both sides so u will be 1 over 2a times secant of theta secant of theta is the reciprocal of the cosine function let's label this as equation number two so our task will be to determine the law of force so for that we need the second derivative of u with respect to theta so let us begin by obtaining the first derivative of u with respect to theta so that's simply one over two a times derivative of secant theta so that's secant theta times tangent theta fine let's label this as number three then we differentiate both sides again with respect to theta so we have d squared u over d theta squared so that will be equals to 1 over 2a so here we have to apply the product rule so we have secant theta times derivative of tangent theta so that is secant squared theta plus derivative of secant theta so that is secant theta plus tan theta times tangent of theta so this gives us 1 over 2a times secant cubed theta plus secant theta times tangent squared theta. Fine. So this is our d squared u over d theta squared. So let's write down the equation of the force. So we have d squared u over d theta squared plus u. So that's equals to negative m divided by l squared u squared times f of u so we have u we have second derivative of u with respect to theta let's substitute all this value so let me write here so we have 1 over 2a times secant cube theta plus secant theta times tangent squared theta plus u so u here is 1 over 2a times secant theta and that's equals to this particular expression so we'll consider this term and this term so let's write the first term as it is well with 1 over 2a times secant cubed theta plus 1 over 2a so what we'll do we'll take secant theta as the common factor so that gives us tangent squared theta plus 1 equals to negative m over l squared u squared times f of u. So this is an identity. So this will get replaced with secant cubed theta. So we have 1 over 2a. We can combine secant theta and secant squared theta to get secant cubed theta. Let's combine the two terms on the right and uh, left hand side because they are the same terms. So we get 1 over a times secant cubed theta. So that's equals to negative m over l squared u squared times f of u. Now what we'll do, we'll write the expression in terms of the force f of u. So that will be equals to negative times we have l squared u squared divided by m times a times secant cubed theta okay now what we'll do we'll replace the sec cubed theta we already obtained that u is equals to 1 over 2a times secant of theta so that means secant of theta that will be equals to 2a u and if we cubed both sides so that's give us to uh, 8 a cubed u cubed so we'll substitute in place of secant cubed so we have negative l squared u squared divided by m a times secant cubed so that will be 8 times a cubed u cubed so 1 a gets cancelled and this is going to give us f of u equals to 8 negative 8 a squared l squared over m times u raised to the power of 5 and 
we substitute u with 1 over r so that gives us the force as a function of the radial vector r so that's equals to negative 8 a squared l squared over m so this is a constant vector that's multiplied to 1 divided by r raised to the power of 5 or we can say that f of r as proportional to negative 1 over r raised to the power of 5. So this is the expression for the force. This result is very significant when this will become useful when we will be discussing about the effective potential. Problem number 3. It's given here that a particle is projected from an abscess at a distance of a with a velocity of v while moving under a central repulsive force which is given by mk over r cube. So we have to prove that number one the equation of the orbit is given by this particular equation and number two we have to show that the relation a tangent to p theta equals to p v t this may be used to determine the time dependence of the angular displacement. So let's begin with the first part. So here, well, let's talk about what's given here. It's given that the particle is projected from an abscess. So that means we recall when a particle is projected from the abscess, then we have Ra times Va. So that's given by L over M. So this is a constant. So in our case, it's given that the distance from the same force center to the abscessal point is A. So that's Ra is equals to A. And this velocity, epsidal velocity, that will be equals to capital V. So that means our equation becomes A times V. So that's equals to L over M. So let's label this as equation number 1. We'll come to this. And here we're also given that we have a repulsive force, which is a function of R. So that will be equals to MK over R cube. So what we'll do, we'll convert f of r to f of u by using the substitution r equals to 1 over u. So we have f of u. So that's equals to m k u q. So we'll use this. I'll substitute this into our force equation. So our force equation is given by the second order differential equation d squared u over d theta squared plus u so that's equals to negative m over l squared u squared times f of u so here f of u is m k u cubed so that means our differential equation now becomes second derivative of u with respect to theta plus u equals to negative m squared times k times u divided by l squared Fine. So m, k, l squared, these are all constants. So we'll bring it to the left hand side. So we have d squared u over d theta squared plus, we can take the u common. So we have 1 plus m squared times k over l squared equals to 0. Now we already showed that. A times V, so that's given by L over M. So that means M over L, so that will be equals to 1 over AV. So let's substitute this here. So we have D squared U over D theta squared plus U times 1 plus K. So L squared over M squared, or M squared over L squared, so that will be simply A squared V squared equals to 0. And this is what P is, this is, uh, we have already been provided with a value of P. So P here is 1 plus K divided by A squared V squared. So we can substitute with P. So that our differential equation now becomes D squared U over D theta squared plus U times P equals to 0. Now this is a very straightforward differential equation. So the solution to this differential equation will be U equals to A times cosine of b theta plus b times sine of b theta. So we have two undetermined constants a and b because we have a second order differential equation. Now 
we need to determine the value of this constant a and b by using the initial conditions now let's use that so we'll use the initial condition that when theta is equals to zero in that case we have this simply means that we are at the epsilon point so at that maximum point or the epsilon point d over d theta so that will be equals to zero and also u is equals to one over r so here r is the distance from the force center to the epsilon point so that's simply a so we'll be having u equals to one over a so let's take this solution of u and we're going to differentiate with respect to theta. So that gives us d u over d theta. So that's equals to negative a times b times sine b theta plus b times b times cosine of b theta. So let's use the initial condition. When theta equals to zero degrees, we have d u over d theta equals to zero. So that's equal. So zero will be equals to negative a p times sine of p times zero. So that will be zero plus b p times cosine of zero. So that's simply equals to one. So this is one. Now when we solve for the constant p, so that will give us the value zero. Then we have our solution simplified to u equals to a times cosine of b theta. Now we need to determine the value of a. So we'll use the condition then when theta equals to zero degree, u is equals to one over a. So we have one over a. So that's equals to a times cosine of b times theta. So theta is zero. So we have cosine of zero, which is one. So that means a is equals to one over a. And this equation of the orbit now transforms to u equals to 1 over a times cosine of b theta or simply u a is equals to cosine of b theta so let's go back to the question so we need to show that a equals r cosine of b theta so that's fine so since u is equals to 1 over r so we have a over r a equals to cosine of b theta so a is equals to r times cosine of b theta. So this is what we are asked to show that the equation of the orbit is given by a equals to r cosine of b theta. Now let's go to the second part. So here we have to show that the relation a times tangent of b theta equals to b v t. So that may be used to determine the time dependence of the angular displacement. Fine. Do that. Part b. So we have the angular momentum l which is given by m r squared theta dot so theta is simply the rate of change of theta fine so if we arrange this equation then what we have is r squared d theta so that's equals to l over m d t now we'll do we'll integrate both sides now in part a we obtain a equals to r times cosine of b theta so from here we can obtain an expression for r so that will be a over cosine of b theta which is simply secant of b theta so that means we have here a squared times secant squared b theta integrated with respect to theta equals to so we have l over m so l over m that we have also mentioned so L over M, so that simply equals to A times the velocity V. So we have integration. So both of them are going to be fixed. So we have AV multiplied to integration of DT. So we have A squared, so a secant squared B theta. So that's going to give us tangent of B theta divided by the factor P. And that's equals to AVT. We can cancel out one A from both the sides so that gives us a times tangent of b theta which is equals to b v t so this is what we are asked to prove so we have to show that the relation a tangent of b theta this is used to determine the time dependence of the angular displacement so yeah so that's what we did we used to calculate the time dependence of the angular displacement and we obtained 
this particular expression so this is the final solution